I'm going to begin by setting a couple of questions for our panel. Uh, and then, uh, no, wait, wait. We're, we're going to start with a little conversation across the table, and then we will uh, extend out. Um, I'd like to ask. I'd like to ask uh, uh, our panelists uh, to first address one of these critical comparative questions that you just closed with. In fact, uh, Pratap, having to do with the relationship. Uh, in the two constitutional and, and, and also political traditions uh, between uh, the insistence on individual equality on the one side and the concern about dealing with uh, the impediments to that equality that have been built into social, cultural, uh, and economic kinds of conditions of life, material conditions, but material conditions that extend, in fact, to, of course, religious life especially in the Indian context. And I'd like to uh, add to that the question that uh, uh, comes out of the way Lee posed the defense and his choices in relationship to the defense over the two cases against the University of Michigan, namely uh, his insistence on linking the question of diversity, which is to say diversity as a value for everyone in the room or in the university or the classroom or the uh, or, or whatever the context might be, and the ways in which diversity is needed because of its work, of the, because of the work it needs to do to address historical uh, uh, oppression, historical discrimination, uh, indeed, again, to repeat what I said before, the historical conditions that have led to uh, the problems that, uh, uh, that have to do with what it means to bring diverse groups together under certain kinds of equal conditions. So uh, just to kind of clarify to at, at the outset the, the, the way these, uh, these, these legal traditions, as it were, have evolved in relationship uh, in some ways to a very similar history, which is to say a history of slavery on the one side, which then continues in all sorts of ways after formal emancipation uh, in the United States, and the history of caste discrimination, which is, as you made clear, and as I think we all agree, clearest uh, and, uh, and most demonstrably uh, a, a, a kind of universal condition uh, with respect to the most oppressed and the most marginalized groups in India, leaving aside for a second the, the kind of uh, openness of, these, of, of some of these groups and categories in the, in the history of scheduling. But obviously referring here specifically to scheduled castes and tribes. I'd like to then la move later in a, in a, in a subsequent uh, exchange uh, to the question of what the, what the broader categories will entail when you start thinking about other backward castes in India or possibly categories in the United States having to do with uh, populations that could be identified of color or uh, uh, you know, the whole question, set of questions that, that, that have to do with whether or not you're on some schedule of underrepresented minorities. But I'd like to bracket that out for uh, the initial question. And so, Lee, I'd like to ask you perhaps first just to reflect a little bit about the American tradition in relationship now to what you've uh, heard from both Mark and, and Pratap and, um, and just try to clarify uh, the really, divergence. Yeah. I, I need to ask. I, I myself am confused. So, uh, but I'm confused in the best possible way, um, <laughs> which is that uh, it's very, very stimulating. Uh, uh, because I think it's um, uh, it's resonating with things that uh, that I have thought about in the American context um, in many ways. Uh, but I, I think in some ways we're, we're trying to get inside of the broad social dynamics of affirmative action when it is linked. Well, affirmative action, we know what it is. And how it 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 sort of helps uh, achieve uh, a broad social goal, or how it actually inhibits or impairs achieving that goal, um, um, and does other things. Could, but could I just ask you to to no for you, Nick, to say again? I, it was when you said you wanted to bracket something. Uh, and, and I just, I think I was uh, thinking about something else and I want to ask, I want to answer. No, no, I just wanted to bracket out the question of who is uh, denominated by 
uh, affirmative action in the Indian and the U.S. cases, whether uh, uh, it be extended beyond uh, the specific populations of scheduled castes and tribes on the Indian side, and whether uh, some of the issues around affirmative action uh, in the United States be extended to populations beyond the African American uh, yeah. community. Uh, I want to wait on that, okay? That, because that was something yeah, that yeah, yeah. will obviously come when we start talking about the the post um, uh, 54 history of, of reservations in India. For the moment, I want to just go to these the, the questions around uh, what Pratap called the ethical requirements of. Uh, of affirmative action in relationship to uh, uh, the divergent discourse as I, as I hear it between uh, diversity as a value for all and diversity as a form of redress for historical exclusions and discriminations and oppressions in the past. And you made clear in your defense uh, of the University of Michigan uh, you needed to link both, but you were also to some extent constrained by as I understand it anyway, the 1978 uh, right. articulation of diversity as a right. particular kind of value uh, uh, of greater importance for the Supreme Court, at least at that point in its decision, uh, than the yeah. historical issue. So, so let me just try um, r recognizing that, um, that I, I may be missing the point. Uh, but I think, I think inside of the social policy and practice of affirmative action is a set of inner tensions that, uh, that, that really uh, have to be uh, sort of revealed. So um, when I think about uh, the first period in American history, with this enormous effort to reshape American life, using race as, as a prototype of what needed to be addressed and then seeing other things from that, often in the context of race, racial uh, divisions that needed to be fixed. An enormous uh, social transformation uh, process that's underway. Affirmative action coming out of that as one tool to achieve this and the argument about linking it with history uh, of injustice is very much motivated by this must change and it must change not only in ending discrimination, we must integrate in a broader narrative to use Pratip's uh, term. But then there is a period in which people say, um, you know, it's not a good thing to link everything to history and make people victims and, and have them live. And, wh and why does this group deserve to be the victims? They're, they're, they've had time since the discrimination. And uh, on the other hand, it's really good to have lots of uh, things. We don't want people to, uh, this generation, to feel as if they're somehow distinctive when, in fact, we've been practicing affirmative action for for centuries, uh, geographic uh, affirmative action is one of the most prominent that's just not put into these debates very often or discussions. So for decades, universities would take people like me from Oregon uh, because they didn't have any people from Oregon in, in New York City. So, so I was the beneficiary. That's, right, that's, that's right. I was the beneficiary of affirmative action in the and you wanted to get people from different parts of the country and you took that into account and maybe their SAT scores or LSATs weren't as high and, and, and that's the same thing with race. So why are we singling these people out and making them an exception and somehow the, the, the victims who need to be helped, let's, let's normalize this. And it's also good for them to, to be normalized. And then that becomes disconnected from the history and it becomes kind of crazy because you, you say, and then the, the point is, I like the, the point, the issue of emancipation on the cheap. And that's a very powerful argument and often made in the context of the affirmative action cases, uh, was made very strongly to me by many people who were opposed to, uh, to what we were advocating. They would say, you are doing more to harm race relations in America than you're doing anything close to helping because 
The real problems are in K through 12, and by the time the students get to you, they're already formed, and, and you now give the society an excuse for not doing anything about this. And, and my view was always, I agree with you, we're just doing the best we can, you know. Uh, it, it, you're going to stop doing a little bit because you can't do, the society won't do a lot. And, and that kind of inner tension, I think, it, revealing these inner tensions to me is, is very important. I, that's what I would say. Uh, yeah, I, uh, this uh, question of diversity uh, is interesting because it seemed to me on both, in both India and the U.S., the driving impulse is to rectify a historical wrong. Uh, That's right. And in some sense, and particularly in the American case, diversity is window dressing. It's because there were people who were reluctant to buy into this notion that we got to depart from equality uh, for this reparative purpose. They say, ah, but diversity, that's a kind of prospective, forward-looking. Uh, we really want a society in which the uh, uh, officer corps looks like the troops. Uh, so uh, it's okay to have diversity because it'll produce that kind of uh, social uh, uh, lubrication uh, as a result. Uh, but in fact, uh, you know, so we, we get this Diversity and, of course, diversity and one other feature the American system has to be put in, in contrast with the Indian system, uh, we, who can be a beneficiary of this? Well, we just use kind of intuition uh, and self-declaration. Uh, as opposed to the Indian system where we have a measured official determination of the eligibility of groups and we have basically these publicly assigned identities of, of eligibility which in some sense uh, creates uh, or, or uh, aggravates the problem uh, as, as, uh, as we defined it, this notion of compulsory identities. but. Uh, so in the American system, it seems to me we, we end up with, you know, recent immigrants from Africa, oh, that's fine uh, because that's diversity. And in some sense, Sandra Day kind of comes forth with this totally incoherent uh, uh, thing. She says, yes, it's diversity, diversity's great, we're not doing this for reparations, it's all for diversity, but it'll go away in 25 years because basically the blacks will be will be integrated. Uh, well, what about other forms of diversity? What about, you know, in 25 years, surely there's going to be some other kind of diversity that will look uh, 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 attractive for policy purposes. So, uh, so in the U.S., as I say, diversity is kind of uh, window dressing, but very influential window dressing. Uh, in, in India, on the other hand, it seemed to me the, the, the rationale uh, of reparation was very much there, but what we, when the OBCs, the other backward classes, get added in, uh, and off in the wings are the Muslims, too, as a possible add-in of another beneficiary group, uh, what we really get is diversity. We get, or in, in the sense of communal quotas, that is, everybody gets their proportional share. This was, it seemed to be, on Bedkar's fear, and the fear of many people in the in the uh, constituent assembly. And they said, we don't we don't want a regime of communal quotas. We want a regime of open uh, movement and open competition. But we are making a an exception or a temporary exception. We hope for the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes uh, in terms of, of basically giving them this additional protection to make sure they, they, they are brought into, into, into the mainstream. Uh, so, but what happens is with the addition of uh, the arrival of the OBCs uh, and basically the, the, the domination of the 
of the compensatory discrimination program by the OBCs, what we end up with is, in effect, uh, a distributive politics uh, that, is, that, that, that is easily translatable into diversity. Everybody gets their share and everybody has to be present. Uh, and uh, so, so, in a curious way, the Indian program, which is, which is rationalized as reparations, uh, ends up being a diversity program, and the American program, which is, which is, is a kind of uh, hidden and very partial reparations program because it has to be labeled and administered as diversity. Um, so just two quick responses. I mean, one, I think, you know, one of the things we've learned, I think, from the, lit the literature and affirmative action in both contexts is that I think the abstract discussion about the relationship between individual liberty and equality, uh, I think the philosophical concepts get you only so far in coming to grips with, in a sense, the phenomenology of the way in which actually identities are formed. Uh, I mean, and, and so, so that it may not be so much a matter of sort of normative resolution, which is in a sense easy. I mean, there's a sort of fairly straightforward structure. It is individual based. There are some individuals who are dis disadvantaged because of their historical circumstances by virtue of the identity that they possess. If you give them the opportunities by some compensatory way, they will be in a position to take those. I mean, th th that's the kind of the simple story. I think what makes the story complicated, I, I think particularly, in a, and you've written so powerfully about it, which is one is the idea of identities being constructed through, in a sense, state legislation or around the axis of what it is that the state distributes. Right? I mean, I mean that, 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 that itself is a sort of, is, is, is a sort of very, it's a, it's a strange conception of both identity and liberty, um, uh, if you like. The second thing, and I think there the, here the contrast with, with the United States is, 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 is interesting, which is that I think the institutional context matters a lot. So in the United States, you were looking at an institutional context of higher education, where institutions have vast discretion in tailoring all kinds of policies, their admission. I mean, they're, they're free institutions. I mean, you know, Columbia comes up with its own criteria and so forth. The difficulty with the Indian model was that the diversity did not extend to any form of diversity of experiments about what kinds of institutional forms could experiments with diversity take. I mean, um, uh, you know, and, and, and so the United States really, the constitutional question is one of permissibility of certain diversity programs. In India, that's a constitutionally settled question. I mean, you know, that's, that's allowed. But paradoxically, that constitutional allowance was set in an institutional context where the state was extremely rigid about right, what particular configurations institutions could actually take. Which is why some of our debate about merit and so forth gets skewed. I mean, you could have easily imagined, I mean, a university system in India, which is more like California. A bunch of colleges will say, we will admit whoever comes. It really doesn't matter, you know, what you're grading. What we will hang our allegiance to is the fact that in two years, right, we will equip you to progress on to a next level of Now, those kinds of experiments are not allowed, right? So, so in a sense, it is that single point that has to bear the weight of all these identity uh, uh, concerns. And in a sense, you know, dramatizes the politics extreme. Um, and the final thing about diversity is, is that in a sense, the, 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 the consequence of the state constructing identities in this way is that what identities are salient, uh, it, it, it becomes a sort of circular argument. I mean, I think, as, I mean, I think everybody agreed that Dalits were a special case, I think, in, 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 in uh, is, but, but which identities you choose to privilege, what kinds of diversities matter, for what purposes that diversity matters. Um, I think that has become entirely self-fulfilling. Okay, I think given the time, we should open up a little bit uh, to some questions and comments. Please uh, make your, your questions brief so we'll have a, a chance to... Uh, yeah, could you please uh, identify yourself when you, when you speak? David? I'm David Schizer from... Uh, 
Thank you. David Schizer from the law school here at Columbia. It's been very interesting to see the comparison between the United States and India. I wanted to propose very quickly another comparison, which is South Africa and India, because the South African Constitution uh, has language which at least was intended to guarantee minimum economic rights to people in the country, and it's proved to be um, somewhat difficult for judges to administer, although there's, there's certainly an effort. We were lucky to have Sindelian Koba, who's just named the uh, Chief Justice of the Constitution here a number of times to teach for us. He's very uh, interesting on the subject. So I suppose, particularly for Professor Mehta, you said um, you know, the reservation system is sort of uh, on the cheap. Would you be attracted to something more like that normatively? Uh, if, if you were, would you want it to be administered by courts or more by the legislature? Um, no, I mean, I think the South African <laughs> example is, is, in a sense, very interesting, right? And, and, and I think the later the constitution is formed, in a sense, the more the state is empowered to do certain kinds of things. Uh, it, I mean, it is an interesting question whether the formal promulgation of constitutional rights is a good predictor of how, in fact, those rights will be realized. I mean, uh, and I think on education, at least primary education, uh, arguably the normative consensus has turned enough in the last 10 years. Uh, even though the right to education has now been promulgated by the Indian Supreme Court, uh, legislation has been passed, that you will sort of get, you know, you'll, you'll begin to get more movement towards in, in, the, in that direction. And courts may actually have a role to play, uh, 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 role, 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 role to play in that. But, but I don't think we should underestimate the fact that there needs to be a honest conversation about all the complex elements that need to be put in place for those rights to be effective ones. Uh, uh, I mean, it's a banal point, but, but, but it, it, it actually doesn't figure in political debate as much. Thank you, I'm Smitha Narula from NYU Law School. Um, I think two points in terms that connect India and the United States that, that haven't really been addressed, but I think go to why the conversation is taking the turn it's taking in both countries have to do with one, the historical, the use of the, even the term historical injustices robs the discrimination in both countries of its very contemporary character. So I'll speak to India in particular. Um, the situation of Dalits in India today, as many of you know, is not one of, of surviving or coming out of a historic oppression condition. It is very much contemporary and it's seen in the daily atrocities in the segregation and just in the vast poverty, violence and discrimination that's meted out against a majority of Dalits in the country today. A very small percentage are actually reached by the reservations program, but the Indian government has also included within that ambit a number of socioeconomic development measures that too have been completely under-enforced or um, sabotaged by a siphoning of funds from those programs to other activities. So even where reservations, or I should say rather affirmative action has been imagined more broadly, it has been under-enforced or completely undermined. Um, the second point is that the language of, that is being used to defeat any sort of affirmative action across both countries is very similar, I think, and, and is, is creating resonance among the two um, continents. The language of meritocracy, of liberalism, of equality, of color blindness, and now increasingly the language of caste blindness serves, I think, to um, use equality as a weapon against affirmative action in a way that really displaces the conversation about contemporary discrimination. All of which leads to the point that um, one could definitely point to the holes in the reservation program, and I think um, Pratap has, has very eloquently stated the ways in which it undermines real conversation for reform. But when reservations have been the only program that have found some traction in terms of enforcement, then isn't taking that away a, a serious injustice and a serious um, ethical quandary for the contemporary forms of discrimination that exist that have found no other traction in Indian society today. I'm Sudha from India. Uh, just a point to add, uh, Smita, that uh, special component plan we are talking about, Government of India, ensures 16.2 per uh, the empowerment of Dalits, but never it's been fully utilized. Only 4 to 5 percent has been utilized for the development of or empowerment of Dalits. And uh, nothing is uh, worked out so far about this. This is one point I would like to make. And uh, you're talking about social mixing, which uh, we hardly find it in uh, institutions as well as in the society. And midday meals program, the dominant caste 
consciously keep away the children their children out of the school for, uh, from eating along with the dalit children or the food cooked by the dalits so where where you know this this is not the fault of the dalits like they are utilizing the uh, uh, policies of the government for social mixing but you know it's consciously kept uh, or uh, abated by the uh, attitude mindset of the dominant caste this is the one point i'd like to make If you like a few more, a few more quick uh, comments and questions. Yeah. This is regarding Meta's uh, uh, statement that ethical relationship rising out of uh, reservation policy. There may be different perspective from the point of view of the Dalits. As long as the OBC gets reservation, they are safe and secure because their reservation will not be taken away. Otherwise. Every other day, you find the newspaper that the reservation policy is going to be banned. So, th that it's are put into hard pressure, and they can always divert attention to some other activity. Another thing, you made a comparison with the United States, saying that opportunities are given to students to qualify themselves. Well, it's all right because the equal education is provided, and the opportunity given is justified. But compare India, where, is, where are the schools? There are no equal schools. So the situation is different. I want to mention this. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mr. Kamble. Hi, this is Raj Kamble from uh, Ambedkar International Mission. Uh, India has almost in the last two decades have almost given up reservation benefits for the scheduled caste, scheduled tribe as far as the job reservations are concerned with the shift from to the free market economy. Uh, it was anyway never fulfilled before. But after 91 free market reforms, uh, it is almost stopped. So uh, that's what we are talking about. And the caste discrimination stays as, as it is. And uh, now the scheduled caste, scheduled tribes, the Dalits are facing much more problems in terms of uh, job requirements. And India, at this want, I want to highlight that government of India has almost stopped reservation in literal sense. Mr. Pratap Mehta. Very uh, brief, so I, I, I mean, I think one point which everybody, all the questions made, are absolutely right, which is, which is, it is really about the reality of contemporary yeah. oppression, right? I, I mean, there's, 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 in a sense, no, 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 no question about it. Uh, what are the instruments that can deal with that? Uh, I think, I mean, that's a larger conversation we need to have about, you know, what. Uh, uh, I do want to say, in, I mean, uh, the, the, the one thing which I will resist, I think, is, is, the, is the political judgment about that reservations would be abolished if OBC's reservation were attenuated. I, I mean, I, I think there's not only no evidence for that, but, 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 but actually, I mean, I think, I, I do think the one consensus there was in Indian society, whether it was not enacted or not, was in a sense about uh, the special history of Dalits. Uh, and, and, and I've never bought this political judgment that reservation will be taken, take, you know, take, 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 taken away. There's absolutely no, 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 no evidence for it. And, and in fact, in fact, I think it is precisely that expansion of reservation that has impeded us talking about exactly these kinds of questions that we need to be talking about. In order to keep the comparative uh, uh, f focus here, I'm going to ask uh, myself, I'm going to ask President Bollinger just to make a comment about the contemporary in relationship to Professor Nevola's question about, about, the, about the contemporary environment within which these kinds of debates are taking place and the historical uh, as well as the almost uh, utopian character of this uh, talk about reparations and diversity uh, tend to obscure that. In the US we have uh, now three states, uh, California, Washington, and Michigan that have had various state ballots that have uh, uh, said that affirmative action uh, should no longer be used. Uh, we have growing uh, concern again, obviously, about uh, the importance of affirmative action at the same time uh, that uh, the election of President Obama has led many to say, see, we don't need this anymore. And in fact, many of the statements coming out of the Obama administration uh, itself have been very uh, ambivalent on the question of affirmative action. So I wondered if, Lee, if you could just say a word about the contemporary today, since we know the same issues, if in a very different set of registers, uh, continue to confront the African-American population in the U.S.? 
Well, uh, so you, you've identified them, and I, I think that um, I, I want to take the statement um, that you made uh, uh, and uh, agree with it. That is, uh, in my oversimplified sort of version of uh, what have been the inner tensions of affirmative action in the United States, uh, I, I want to say that the sort of effort to link affirmative action and, and what it's doing, what its purposes are, what it means uh, is not only to, when one says link it to the historical roots, it's also linking it to the present and to the discrimination that exists, that is the problems have not been overcome. Uh, and uh, that is something that uh, I think my own view has been that is critical to maintaining the social meaning of of everything, both the historical roots and the recognition of reality um, as it is. So, so it, it, I mean, anybody who thinks that racism is uh, is gone in American society is crazy. Um, it's just way too much uh, of very painful evidence. Uh, and, and most of the cities uh, in the United States uh, many of them are more segregated today than they were in 1955, 1960. And even though it's through housing patterns and, and the like, there are so many public practices that make that happen, contribute to that, not least of which is the system of school funding, uh, which bases uh, uh, what kind of school you can go to on the wealth of the people in your district. Uh, uh, so uh, there's so many practices that lead to a society that is truly fractured along racial lines. Uh, so you, you want to keep that reality before you and you want to keep the, the narrative of history present and, and that's what gives it energy and that's what gives it meaning and, and, uh, and the like. And yet there are very good pro-affirmative action reasons as well as anti-ones for wanting to disconnect it. And that, that's really my, one of my key points, that it's, it's got this inner tension, even when they're in favor of it, to want to disconnect it from, uh, from all of this. And I'm afraid uh, we are, and, and that, from my point of view, that happened for such a long period of time, that kind of disconnectedness that it allowed people who were really against affirmative action for other reasons um, to really gain the upper hand in American society. And I think we are now so far away from, I mean, just in terms of time, from 1954 and 1960 and 65, I think we're so far away, a new generation detached from, from these events. And the and the failure of the pro-affirmative action sides to keep it, uh, the story uh, alive has led to a point in time when uh, it, it, affirmative action has lost a huge amount of its social meaning. And I think that's really unfortunate given the reality of, of present discrimination. And there is a lot of movement to try to, to as we know, to try to gain uh, uh, maintain this and also the opponents that the, sort of the high ground is let's start doing class rather than race. Um, and that's the thing. And the answer to that is, from my point of view, of course we should do class. Yes, we do class actually. Um, but don't fool yourselves. Doing class is not working on race in America. If you only take account, I've given this speech a hundred times. The studies that have been done by some people in, on our law faculty, if you have a system of admissions in higher education and all you look at is the income of the family, um, that's all you know, just the, the, the sort of where they are in the economic system, you're going to get a class that's overwhelmingly white because the numbers end up um, uh, th that way. Uh, so, um, so it's not uh, a benefit, and then, uh, and then we know the, the claim also that one of the things that constantly undermines affirmative action as a social policy is the feeling that it's well, it's based on racial classifications. We said that was wrong. Now we're using it to sort of that's a conundrum. That's a paradox. You know, so it's that inner kind of 
tension that constantly has to be explained, and I think that's where history and present reality really uh, matter again, that that is playing itself out here too, again, very powerfully. So when President Obama says, I do not believe my children should get the benefits of affirmative action, there are many, many people in the society who take that to mean um, affirmative action has run its course, it's done its job, it's time to, uh, to uh, move on. And I think we're, that's where that 25 year period of Sandra Day O'Connor is so significant. I, I think we're sort of in the, most people think we're in the twilight of what this is all about, when in fact uh, the reality continues in, in very, very uh, obvious ways, I think. I'm going to take just a few more questions. We have uh, about five minutes. Please uh, make your comments, uh, make your questions as, as sharp and as uh, crisp as possible. Uh, my name is Gyan, uh, Gyan Pandey. Um, before all, all the questions go to Pratap, I want to ask another question of Lee Bollinger and, and uh, one that has some comparative uh, interest. Um, uh, I, I think you identify very well this tension between uh, talk about historical injustice and um, the idea of quality of education, um, diversity, right? I think the real challenge both in India and in the United States must be to go beyond what is politically acceptable to, to maintain what you call the social meaning of affirmative action, right? To maintain that, one needs to go beyond what is socially acceptable, that is diversity in some sort of loose, uh, you know, liberal sense, and to, to bring to its heart the question of historical and contemporary injustice, to maintain that as part of the discourse. So my question to you really is this. You said that you wanted to, uh, to, to refer to both when it came to cases in Michigan. I wonder how you actually do that, and to get Sandra Day O'Connor to hear that, just as in the, in the Indian case, there are particular things that are hearable, that you can actually hear, that are acceptable. And those are the arguments that people put forward because they're the ones that are effective. Well, uh, uh, very quickly, uh, the, the data are fairly compelling. Uh, and they go like this. Uh, most young people who arrive on the campuses of our major universities come from high schools that are basically all black or all white. So the way I put it, the first time they encounter an integrated world in their educational and in their, even in their lives is when they are on our campuses. Now that can be an overstatement in some universities versus others, but it's a basic truth about American society. And, and it, it sort of re it, it illuminates uh, a point, uh, if you're, especially if you're in law, because Brown versus Board of Education was supposed to sort of stop that from being the case, and here we are 50 plus years later. And, and then you say, there must be something really, really difficult about getting a society to integrate across racial ethnic lines. So that must be something really hard to do. And it must be something that much, goes much beyond race and ethnicity to the ways in which we think about groups and the ways in which we think about other people that we've identified as different from ourselves. And that turns out to be a fairly profound subject of education, whatever you're dealing with, uh, not just race or ethnicity. And therefore, you have a prime human experience that is intimately related to everything we do in, in most everything we do in, in, uh, in education, uh, especially in the humanities, social sciences, and professions. And therefore, it is meaningful from an educational diversity standpoint. But you have to marry the two uh, because if you just I mean, diversity, educational diversity, which we believe in, but it has to be rooted in some, I mean, in practice, it has to be rooted in something that makes it educationally valuable. And, the only, and what does it here is how people perceive other groups. My name is Yogesh Ferrari. I'm at the Center for Justice 
and peace? Uh, I have the, I had the privilege here in 1991 to celebrate Dr. Ambedkar's birth anniversary. I thank the Columbia University for all the wonderful programs that you have been holding in that. Now, uh, our organization has been going to United Nations for the last 20 years. In 1996, on Committee on Elimination of Racial Discrimination, we brought the issue of discrimination and the committee gave a judgment that India should start immediately on Article 31, a human rights education to educate the Indian population on eradicating the institutionalized thinking of high caste and low caste mentality. India has not taken it seriously. We had the meetings with the National Human Rights Commission also on that matter. This is part one. Part two is on the education matters. Committee on Child Rights also brought. Yes. Yes. I, uh, the Committee on Child Rights also recommended the national education for all the children according to Indian constitution. That has not been implemented. My question is India boasts as the largest and biggest democracy around the world, whereas it fails to implement even the recommendations of an international body. How do we make the country like India to abide by it? I think we're going to ask uh, each of our panelists uh, to just make a, a last comment if they, if they have one. Uh, and uh, you do, of course, uh, invoke one of the issues that President Bollinger alluded to in his opening remarks about the international context within which now uh, increasingly we need to think about these questions, but also uh, uh, upon which we will need to, uh, uh, upon which we'll need to rely in order to make sure that actually things uh, continue uh, to change in some fundamental ways. But uh, Mark, do you want to just make well, a... Well, I just wanted to say that uh, I think there are many justifiable criticisms of the Indian programs in terms of their, their priorities and, and particular implementation. But I, I do think we, if we sort of step back a little, uh, we should appreciate the, the uh, persistence and generosity uh, in, in terms of, uh, of the Indian programs, in terms of institutionalizing a kind of uh, generosity at the national level, which is really quite rare, uh, with all its shortcomings and, uh, and all its faults, uh, it is, I think, a quite remarkable uh, achievement, and, uh, and it also embodies a kind of view of Indian civilization over the long haul that I think uh, uh, is some protection against the kind of very short run, uh, we must have a, a sh the, the kind of uh, short run uh, um, perspective that it seems to me is, is, uh, is deathly for so many social programs. Uh, I think the, f the full answer to your question it will be should be the subject of another conference at this center in a year's time. It'll take uh, 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 it, it, it'll take uh, that that much time. But 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 the short answer is you 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 have to you know there are no quick fixes. You have to do the hard work of politics. Um, it's not something legal scholars like to hear. And it's not something activists like to hear. But that is the truth. My last uh, comment is just to say that the question that was raised uh, by, by all of our panelists, especially in reference to India, about the, uh, uh, the extension of reservations from scheduled castes and tribes to some backward classes or castes and then other backward classes, OBCs, of course, as, as you know and as Prathap said, uh, uh, feeds into or builds out of rather uh, an extensive history of political mobilization in India going back to the early 20th century, but also raises uh, many uh, very pressing contemporary questions about the relationship between reservations and popu popular mobilization and, 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 and political action. But these two will require another conference, so I hope the Southern Asian Institute will uh, mm -hmm. uh, reconvene us for all sorts of uh, questions soon. But I want to thank our panelists for a very, very stimulating uh, presentation. Of Thank you, everyone. Thank you, President Bollinger, for taking time out of your schedule to come and do this. Thank you, Pratap, Mark, and Nick.